Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture, and our topic today is the church, and my very special guest is Alistair Begg, who is are you a, are you a transplanted European from Scotland, or, or or do I put European and Scotland next to each other? How does this mm, it's work? Hard, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I don't know anymore. No, right? I know. No, nobody knows it anymore. <laughs> ah, I'm a hybrid now. You're a hybrid uh, yeah. now. I, well, Scotland is my birthplace. Uh-huh. I lived in England from the age of 15. Okay. So that fierce Scottish nationalism was eroded. Okay. Enough to uh, you know enjoy the United Kingdom, and then. You know, I've now lived longer in the States than I lived in the UK. Oh, wow. So cricket's not a bug to you? No, no. <laughs> cricket's a mystery to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great. Well, um, so you, uh, you're a pastor of a church in, in Cleveland, Ohio, is that right? And yeah. how long have you been there? Suburban Cleveland. We're <laughs> about 20 miles south and east. Uh, I've been there since the 3rd of August, 1983. Oh, wow. So almost 34 uh, years yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I've been here a year longer, so that's basically okay. the same thing. Yeah, yeah, ministry. kind of like a lifetime, isn't it? It is, yeah. So. Um, and uh, and and describe the nature of your ministry. What do you what do you hope to do in your church from the pulpit? That kind of thing. What? Yeah. How do you how do you view your? Well, I know you know Scotland, and so yeah. you've you've seen the pipe bands in Scotland. That's true. And the and the man at the back with that gigantic drum uh-huh. that he plays left to right. Uh-huh. And uh, sometimes the pipes stop and the snare drums stop, mm-hmm. and all that remains is that one drum. Mm-hmm. And I think. Actually, what I do is I play that drum Hmm. in the sense that trying to just consistently sound out the note of Scripture Mm -hmm. with all the other instrumentation that's going on around it. Mm -hmm. But that never never is silent, Mm -hmm. whether whether it's me that's there or whether it's one of my colleagues that's there. So essentially, teaching the Bible in such a way that doesn't simply seek to provide information for people, Mm -hmm. but hopefully brings them into a direct encounter with the living God through His Word. That sounds like a wonderful goal. Well, our topic today is the church, and in particular, we're going to talk about a particular age group, the millennials in the church, but I want to talk about the church first and then the millennials. Uh, so, uh, and, and there's a reason for this, because um, the millennials as a group are are in a kind of, at least the ones who are associated with the church, are in almost a kind of love-hate relationship with the church these days uh, in, in at many levels, and we want to take a look at that. Uh, but first, we want to articulate uh, perhaps what the church ought to be in the midst of a world in which so many things are changing uh, around us. Uh, I think we could hardly go through the last couple of years, whether we're talking about the situation in Europe and Britain or we think about the situation in the United States or globally, we think about the growth of the church around the world and not see that we're part of a changing world. So. So, you know, the church is, in one sense, the apple of God's eye. Right. Uh, it, it's where he manifests himself. So how, do you, how, how would you talk to people about how they should think about the church before they even walk in one? Right. Well, I mean, if we're talking about somebody away on the outside with no real understanding of church, um, I think I might, I might – start at the very end, the, mm-hmm. the, the ultimate purpose of God, to mm-hmm. put together this company of people that come from such a diverse background, mm-hmm. so that there is an inherent diversity that is built into the plan of God, mm-hmm. and that the unity that he creates is in relationship to different nations, people's languages, and tongues. So you're, you're talking about Ro- uh, Revelation 4 and 5, where yep. all the nations are gathered praising the name of God and what he's done through Jesus Christ, and, right. and, and there, I mean... Diversity sometimes is a hard word for the church, but in that case, that's a very biblical diversity, and that's a very healthy diversity. Yeah, and so that's if you like, that's the final. That's the final product. Uh-huh. So that the church, local church, our church, is supposed to be at least some kind of charcoal sketch uh-huh. that approximates to that. Yes. That if you think of what <clears throat> God is doing in the world in gathering. Mm-hmm. The, the story you see the story of the Bible as they were scattered, they were gathered, they were scattered, mm-hmm. and the, the idea of a broken world being repaired 
within the context of the church, so that the church is supposed to be a place that gives a kind of microcosm of what God is ultimately planning to do. I They're, call it a sneak preview. Sneak preview. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Charcoal sketch yeah, of that, which yeah. will finally come in glorious technicolor. Mm-hmm. To try and think of it in those terms, so I don't think of it, first of all, in institutional terms Mm -hmm. or in architectural terms, Mm -hmm. but in relational terms. Mm -hmm. Or even political terms. Or definitely not in political terms, because that's Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we won't go there. Not not immediately. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So so it's a play, you know, Paul describes the ministry that he's engaged in as a ministry ultimately of reconciliation, so it isn't a case, a piece of bringing people together who in one sense or another have been estranged, estranged from God on the one hand, estranged from one another on the other. And so it should be, a, a, I like the picture of a place of gathering, a place of gathering where eyes are all pointed in the same direction. Right. You know, we're all looking to the same leader, the same Savior, the same King, the same Lord, however you want to express it, and of course, yeah. it's Jesus Christ. Yeah, and I, th- I think uh, that comes across so clearly in in, in Ephesians as much as anywhere, mm-hmm. where he talks about we we have the, the the wall of partition has been broken down. The two and out have of become, the two one. become one new body. That's right. And the and the interesting thing about that passage, of course, is is that the one new man that it talks about is not something that's going on inside the individual. That's actually a corporate entity that that's we're right. talking about. That's right. I like to tease people that the passage in Colossians says, you know, there are no bar- Barbarians or Scythians in the one new man. I said that I don't go to the doctor, and he says to me, "Oh, you're sick, Daryl, because you got too many barbarians and Scythians <laughs> fighting inside of you." No, that's not the metaphor. The metaphor is groups of people who are gathered together right. in a community that is different than the way the rest of the world is living. Exactly. That's what the church is supposed to be. That's what the church is. Yeah, that's what the church. We hope is yeah. right. Well, it, yeah, yeah. In terms of in terms of the, I mean. The essential church, right. or the invisible church. Right. I mean, that is what God is in the process of doing. Right. We've got it fouled up at the local level. Right. Right. Pretty consistently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but at least the target should be clear that that's where we're going. That's what God has designed this to be. That's the way it's supposed to function. He's given us the Spirit of God to enable us to be able to be that which He is is working in us as he, he gives us His Spirit to make us into those kind of people. So that's what the church hopefully is is and is aiming towards. And well, the, is, what we're trying to do is become what we are. That's right. That's fair. Not, not become what we're not. Right, right. So, yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I think the church is sometimes slow to recognize is that God has given us everything that we need to be that already. Right. And sometimes we shell short what it is we've received by God's grace. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Again, in Ephesians, you know, you've been seated, you've mm-hmm. been raised, you right. are. And he prays for them that they would be filled with all the fullness of God. And they've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Exactly. So we yeah. can, we can just talk to each other in the language of Scripture. We'll be in great shape. Well, well, but you know, I think part of the part of the challenge is that the, that there's an identity crisis right. within the church. Mm-hmm. That people who attend church mm-hmm. and would be adherents to church don't really know who they are. Right. Yeah. So, oh, well, that's, uh, that's a whole other podcast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so let, I want to dive into this list. This, uh, th- this list that we're going to go through is a list written by a millennium, uh, by a millennial rather, who says he loves the church, but uh, is also communicating to the church why millennials as a group struggle with the church. Now, I've got to do a disclaimer before I start this, which is, this is a terrible thing to do, to put everybody under the same label all at once. It risks generalization and that kind of thing. But the flip side of it is, is, is to try and articulate the sensitivities that a group of people, maybe not every single person in that group, but many of them feel when they encounter the church. And so we're going to go through these one at a time. There are 12. And, uh, and just uh, respond to what we think is – uh, of merit here, or what the church needs to be sensitive to on the one hand, and to also perhaps articulate uh, what might be uh, missing or a part of this conversation that also needs to be considered. So we're, we're going to try and balance this out. But, but I introduced this list because at the seminary, of course, and I'm sure this is true in your ministry, we minister to a large 
block of millennials. They are, make up a very substantial portion of the people who are in school uh, with us here. And I have come not to view the millennial as um, this alien from a foreign land who's invaded my territory, but very much a, a, a group that has sensitivities and sees things that we might miss because we've been too close to it. So, um, so this is this list has gone through with some sensitivity that there could be some merit in some of what's being said about the church here. So here's the first one. Uh, it's it's a hard one to come with. First, it says nobody's listening to us. Let me read a little bit of it so you get the feel of what it's saying. Millennials value voice and receptivity above all else. When a church forges ahead. Without ever asking for our input, we get the message loud and clear. Nobody cares what we think. Why then should we blindly serve an institution that we cannot change or shape? Hmm. That's a pretty strong indictment. Yes, it is. I mean, just as you read that, I, I think that in a church where that is true, it's probably true across the board hmm. in that the whole categories of people are probably not being listened to. Hmm. It may be a style of leadership hmm. that stifles any kind of participation in mm -hmm. that way. Um, but it, to the extent that uh, you know, young people like that would feel that somehow or another we have reintroduced the notion of uh, children should be seen and not heard, and, uh -huh. just, and just moved it up the food chain, <laughs> yeah. then uh, yeah, there's a, there's a legit there's a legitimate issue there. Mm -hmm. How how the how the listening takes place mm -hmm. in in that kind of context is an interesting question as well. It, I think, I think you know, just thinking as a pastor, as I walk the hallways, as I have occasion to say hello, how are you, where are you, how are you doing, to to engage people in a way that actually conveys to them that I am actually, one, interested in them, mm -hmm. and two, I recognize that they have a perspective, and three, that I'd love to hear it. Mm -hmm. But if I, if I don't evince that kind of notion, then I'm sure it contributes to that sort of feeling. Yeah, one of the things that we've tried to do here is we're – and we've just started to do this – is to meet pretty – uh, regularly with different groups of students to get their voice and say to them out loud, we actually want to hear what what you're saying. You know, right. this is this is a, this meeting is very very intentional in terms of what it's about, and and making sure that we set up whatever particularly decision making committees we have and that kind of thing that plan out the events that we do. That there is certainly some representation and input. That sought and then, and then the other trick is, of course, is to take some of what is said uh, and, and make that part of the implementation of what you do. Obviously, where it has merit, and 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 work to make sure that you're sending conscious structural signals that you are uh, listening to this group and that their input does matter. It's good. Yeah, I yeah. think that's that's good. That's a way to handle. It. So, so it, it, nobody. It starts off. Nobody's maybe listening to us. So, I guess my plea is: well, some people are listening. We're listening. We've right. heard this. So, we would try and uh, do what we can to deal with this. But I do think that sometimes it's easy, particularly with a church or an institution that has some history, and that has a level of leadership that's perhaps significantly older. For them to be making all the decisions and to and to only hear the wheel when it squeaks, right? You know, right. as opposed to in the process of planning and developing and looking ahead, uh, involving them uh, in, into the conversations at the point at which decisions are being made, rather than reacting to right. it. Well, you know, on a practical level, one of the ways that we are. I suppose addressing it in part mm -hmm. is by constantly introducing to our pastoral team uh, lower and lower uh, ages mm -hmm. so that these people are on our pastoral team, mm -hmm. therefore flavoring the discussion, therefore insofar as they represent a demographic, if we put it that way, right. that if they are engaged with their own – sounds terrible – but if, if they're engaged with their own group, as it were. Right then to the extent that they are in communication with one another, then their voice is actually being heard. And w the challenge for me in my dotage now uh -huh. is to make sure that I'm trying to create a climate mm -hmm. in those conversations where the youngest voices, whether it's of interns or members of our pastoral team, actually feel that their participation 
is not only valued but is necessary. Yeah, and and uh, the you know a key part of this conversation is the way in which that input is, is dealt with and honored, and and the way in which there's a sense of participation uh, in in the group. Well, uh, we could probably spend the whole podcast on just that first one, but let me go on to the second one. It says, now, uh, this guy's vivid, so I'm just, you know, <laughs> we're sick of hearing about values and mission statements. Okay, here's the subplot. Mm. Sweet Moses, people, give it a rest. <laughs> of course, as an organization, it's important to be moving in the same direction, and that should be easier for Christians than anyone because we already have a leader to follow. Jesus was insanely clear about our purpose on earth. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Love God, love others, task completed. Yeah. Well, you know, my immediate reaction to that is there's another group out there who for ages have been saying, why can't you clarify what it is we're doing here? <laughs> so we're yeah. bending over backwards to address that question and fouling it up on the other side. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 think there's some, I think there's some validity to that. I, I you know, I, I think the clarity, the real question for me is, are we, are we oriented around the gospel? Mm -hmm. You know, and... If if we're be, if we're seeking to be a gospel church, mm -hmm. then we're pretty well where this questioner is is asking, mm -hmm. you know, and that constantly has to be reinforced though, because if we're if we are not uh, establishing our identity and defining our progress around the gospel, we for sure are going to be doing it around somewhere else. That's right. And some of the default places uh, are are. Distinctly unhelpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, one of the challenges of the church, of course, is is that, and it's, and this is where the diversity picture comes back in. Is is it's so it's cross generational. It's not just, you know, the church is not just about millenniums. It's not just about boomers. It's not just about the tweeners. You know, it, it's about all those groups and getting them uh, to participate and understand with and alongside one another. And the expectations that people have of their institutions, of those different age groups, are a little bit different, I think, colored perhaps by the different experiences they've been through sociologically, et cetera. So a church that repeatedly says, hopefully clearly, this is what we're about, is important. And I think the other thing that this may be getting at, I think the other points are going to show this is, well, we can talk about what our mission is and what our values are until we're blue in the face. Yeah, what are we, are we actually do doing? Yeah. yeah, exactly. <clears throat> right, right. And I think that's uh, – that, in fact, the next point uh, – the. The next point is an interesting one because it, it injects us into a segment of that concern coming out of this concern for loving others. The third one is helping the poor isn't a priority. This is what he what it said. Right. My heart is broken for how radically self-centered and utterly American our institution has become. Now, this is great asking someone who didn't grow up in America <laughs> this question. Uh, let's clock the number of hours the average church attender spends in church-type activities, Bible studies, meetings, groups, social functions, book clubs, planning meetings, talking about building community, discussing a new mission. And let's clock the number of hours serving the least of these. Oh, awkward. Yeah. Well, um. Let's take the best models in history. You, you, the, it's, it's almost a false dichotomy if the church is dealing with it correctly. Mm -hmm. You take, for example, Spurgeon mm -hmm. in Victorian England. Mm -hmm. um, he's known as the Prince of Preachers. Mm -hmm. it's, his, his church was, in you know, 20th century terms, a front door church. Mm -hmm. People came through the front door. Right. They didn't come through the side doors. They came to hear Spurgeon preach. Mm -hmm. But... He's the one who established the orphanages. Mm -hmm. He's the one who had the people out in the rural villages. He's the one who was saying, when the gospel takes root in a culture, it does all these things. Mm -hmm. And part of, the, uh, part of the challenge I have in, in hearing that kind of thing is to have to say to my young friends, now, wait a minute, the real poverty the real poverty that we're dealing with is the poverty of soul. Mm -hmm. I mean, William Booth, the Salvation Army, mm -hmm. he says, you know, you can put new trousers on a man, you can give him an education, you can give him three square meals a day, but unless the Holy Spirit has changed him from the inside out, ultimately all of that is not there. That's not an argument for not engaging with the poor, but it is an argument for making sure that we distinguish between the nature of the saving work of Christ 
and the expressions of what it means to be gospel-oriented as a result of that we're not saved by it, but we're saved for it, mm-hmm. Ephesians 2.10. Mm-hmm. That, and where there is an absence of that, then we've clearly missed understood the nature of what it means to be in Christ. And I would imagine that uh, the person who writes this is responding to uh, a sort of complete absence there. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's got to be genuine, you Mm -hmm. know. I mean, it's not going to be setting up soup kitchens to try and get the millennials off our backs. Right, right. It's got to – I mean, we've got to be – We've got to be engaged in this because we truly understand that this is the call of Christ to us. Right. It's to go to the least, the last, and the left out. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think some churches are better at it than others. Some, by virtue of where they're placed, have a greater opportunity than others. Where we live in suburbia, mm-hmm. um, you know, we have to go to the inner city mm-hmm. to make those expressions. Mm-hmm. And that can feel kind of weird as well, you mm-hmm. know, like, oh, here come the rich people, you know, to, to you know, solve their consciences because mm-hmm. we don't have these opportunities that are immediately on our doorstep. Yeah, and I sometimes say that churches sometimes feel like they have to reinvent the wheel to make this happen. Yep. But there actually are a lot of extant organizations in their communities where this is already being attempted and done, and churches can encourage people to be involved in those kinds of efforts as a way of expressing this Christian compassion, which I see this as fundamentally a reflection of, um, in order to express that Christian compassion and, and to show a presence and in some cases do so in a way in which you might actually be working shoulder to shoulder with people who also need the soul care that sure. you're talking about. Sure. And, and actually... I think part of the thing that we've that that I fail to do in the church is to let the congregation itself know everything that's going on. That's right. Because there's tons of stuff that is being done, you know, selflessly but very effectively in the very way in which you're speaking. That's right. It's not a. Is it, we don't constantly put it up on the screen and we right. we're dealing with it. But in terms of unwed mothers, in terms of the the Boys Club of America, in terms of food at five o'clock in the afternoon for kids that haven't eaten all that day. Members of my congregation are involved in all of these things in an unheralded way. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that would be encouraging to someone who asks a question like this is just actually to take the lid off, as it were, Mm -hmm. and, and just say, look at what's happening. Yeah, you can see what's going on. We, you know, in our church, uh, one of the things that we do is we have a testimony periodically about the way people are involved in that's their good. community to make a yeah. visible way. Yep. Give a portion of the service that says, uh, "Here's an." It's both kind of an opportunity informational thing, but also a testimony to the fact of, in some cases, how easy it is to do right. this. You know that they're that they <laughs> put a no excuses clause right. on top of it and say and say this is something that can be done. Well, we've managed to get through three of our 12 as we're coming up to the first break here. And when we come back on the other side, we're going to go through the remainder of the list. But this is, a, this is, I think, a healthy and important conversation to be having about how people view the church and the strengths and weaknesses. And almost it gives an opportunity for a kind of self-assessment about where the church as an institution is. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a useful but painful exercise. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll try and keep the pain to a minimum or make sure the surgery is as painless uh, as possible as we man, go through. Good. We're going through 12 lists of things that millennials struggle with about the church. We've gone through three, so if I do my math, that means we got nine left. So here we go. We're tired of you blaming the culture. From Elvis's hips to rap music, from Footloose to twerking, every older generation comes to the same conclusion. We were just talking earlier about generalization. This right, probably right. does the same thing in the other direction, but that's okay. Uh, the world is going to pot faster than the state of Colorado. Uh, <laughs> we're aware of the downfalls of the culture, believe it or not, and we actually are living in it too. Perhaps it's easier to focus rather it's perhaps it's easier to focus on how terrible the world is out there than actually address. The mess within it. Okay, that's pretty either orish. But yeah. what do you think? Well, I think one of the one of the things uh, in terms of the role that I fill and the, 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 the and share with others around the nation. I don't want to be unkind to my colleagues, but but it, I don't know how many of them actually realize that we are the culture. Mm-hmm. Right, we make up part of it. We right, are, we are in it. Right, um, and that. It would be good to 
let our congregations know that we actually understand this, <laughs> that we read something other than our Bibles, uh -huh. that we are alert to things that are going on and moves, and that we don't see them always in terms of um, us and them. Mm -hmm. there, there is a tone in a, in a congregation that is set from the pulpit without question. And, you know, I think it's Perkins, one of, one of the old Puritans who had, I think he had seven categories of listeners that mm. he told his friends, you better keep in mind that they're there. And I, I couldn't repeat them for you now, but an awareness of that I find tremendously helpful. And it prevents me from, you know, I like to try and think that five people from my immediate neighborhood are sitting on the front row. Right. Now, how am I approaching this? Right. As opposed to, now you, we're all in here in the salt box and they're all out there in the, in the, in the mire. And, <laughs> right. And that, that stuff is, I don't like that myself. I, yeah. I don't like it when I find it. And so I'm on guard against it. Yeah. I, I, th I find myself when I'm speaking sometimes hearing myself speak and saying, okay, I've just spoken to the insiders. Right. Now, what do I say to those on the – what do I say to the person who, if I were encountering them on the street and right. I didn't know what their spiritual status was, how would they hear what I'm saying? Exactly. And, 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 and think through that. I also think that another element of this one is that sometimes there are things in the culture that are exemplary, that do model sure. something positive. And if every na if every illustration of our culture is negative, right. then we send one signal. Whereas if it's mixed, it's probably more a reflection of the reality that a lot of people sense they live in. Yeah, yeah. I I said to somebody, I think it was just the last thirty six hours, somebody mentioned uh, Christopher Hitchens, mm -hmm. the late Christopher Hitchens, right? And I said, oh, he was my favorite atheist. Mm -hmm. And the person said, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. You know, as if. You, you can't have a favorite atheist. I mean, is, yeah. he, he only exists as, as the butt of our, you know, uh, animosity. Right. And I said, did you ever read anything he wrote? Did, mm -hmm. you, did you ever pay attention? And if you did, it would make you weep. It wouldn't make you uh, become, you know, strident in the way you are. And that's, I think that's Paul to Titus mm -hmm. in Crete. Uh -huh. Teach these people to be eager mm -hmm. to do good, to mm -hmm. be engaged, you know. Uh, it falls, you know, as it goes from the pulpit, so it really goes for a congregation. Yeah, I think this is something that, that's uh, interesting to think about. And some pastors who I sometimes view as what I would call tone deaf uh, speak so consistently, so negatively about everything that's going on around them that that you wonder if they see the kindnesses that do sometimes appear and the things that are that are worth merit not to not but the flip side of course is there are things to complain about yeah but you know let, let, why why is la la land gonna, yeah. gonna win the oscar uh -huh. let's think about it you uh -huh. know yep. yep you know the celebration yeah. of something you know exactly. the, yeah yep okay number five uh, the you can't sit with this effect. There is life changing. There's a life. There's this life changing mu movie. All humans must see, regardless of gender. And I'm already disqualified. The film, of course, is the 2004 classic Mean Girls, which I haven't seen. Never so, um, in the film, the most popular girl in school forgets to wear pink on Wednesday, a cardinal sin. To which Gretchen Weiner screams, "You can't sit with us." Today, my mom said to me, "Church has always felt exclusive and clicky, like a high school." With sadness in her voice, she continued, "I've never been good at that game, so I stopped playing." Playing. The truth is, I share her experience, and so do thousands of others. Yeah. Ooh, wow, that's painful. Yeah, you know, it's an irony for me that when I talk, when I when I listen, mm -hmm. <laughs> when I try and listen, uh -huh. um, you know, the, the 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 in terms of sort of moral consensus or how 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 potentially blurred are the lines around certain sacrosanct parts of. Um, Christian morality. Mm -hmm. the, the, many of these young people are prepared to, to debate with me many of these things. The one thing that is, a, is, is the fundamental taboo is you can't be mean. Mm -hmm. You just can't be mean. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned is if I sound mean, mm -hmm. then even if I'm not mean, mm -hmm. I've lost half of the conversation right mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And so it works for me then to think, does, how does my tone sound? Right. You know, so when you... When we're engaged in conversation, not only from the pulpit, but when the people come to you afterwards and, you know, have reaction and uh, questions, I've had to really work at trying to say to myself, now, 
think just a moment, you know, before mm-hmm. you before you take, <laughs> take take and react like an old like an old guy. Yeah, and and, and I think that the, I actually think this is connected to something that was said earlier that I don't feel heard. I don't feel like I belong. Yep. This is really a I don't belong complaint in one to yes, one degree is. or another, yes, which takes us back to that that space. Okay, but what is it? What is it? What is it that we have to tell them that they know they belong? I I you know I I think about that and I go it may not be an action of something that's said it may have to be something that's done right you know so again we're back to how involved are we how much are we listening how much are we engaging how much are we in conversation with them how much are we how much how much are they feeling like they can express themselves with the idea of you know there are two kind of ways a person a person can express themselves and then I can defend where I've been right that doesn't do any good or I can actually you know, engage them, and if there are concerns I have about the what they're saying to me about where they're coming from, if I give them the space to express where they're coming from to me, and I show some honoring of that and respect, right. I also at the same time create the space for me to do the reverse. That's good. And so, um, and, and and frankly, sometimes I think it's the responsibility of the older person, the older group. To show that space to the younger person than vice versa, because theoretically, as I I should be the person as the more mature person who's willing to go there, right. you know. Although sometimes I think the way we tend to think, well, I'm the older person; he should respect his elders, and that's yeah. the end of it. But you know, there's something that just occurs to me, Daryl, that uh, this is not actually new. Yeah, no, this not is at all. Not new. No, no. I, 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 I did can, this with my parents. Yeah, I can take you. To, I can take you. 1972. Uh-huh. I visit America for the first time. Uh-huh. I, I, I'm asked to speak in, uh, give a little story in, in the church in suburban Detroit. Uh-huh. My jeans were tighter than uh, if they'd been painted on. Uh-huh. My hair was as long as the front of the James Taylor album. Okay. I gave an articulation of uh, following Jesus. Uh-huh. And as I walked back to my seat, uh-huh. the pastor said, there you are, folks. Even people who look like that can actually be Christians. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That yeah. was, very, that was yeah. very inclusive. Yeah, yeah. It made me feel good. Yeah, look how far you've come. <laughs> 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 now I'm doing it to people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, okay, the next one. This is this is number six. We're not even halfway through. Um, distrust and misallocation of resources. I'm not going to read the underneath of this. I do think that there is um, an interesting – um, how can I say this? An interesting testimony and observation that comes from people in the congregation about how a church uses its resources. Right. Right. A- across the board. Across the across board. Across the board. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So it's, no, it's no surprise if, if somebody is 24 and they're asking the question because somebody who's 64 may be asking, asking the, the same, same question. question. So exactly. what, that, what that really argues for is, uh, is scrupulous honesty mm-hmm. and being able to, to give full disclosure to the, the the use uh, the use of funding mm-hmm. and and you know when when you begin to when you begin to build a team of people who are missionally involved both locally and around the world and you support them and the people are aware of that then they begin to see they do the math themselves they say well this is costing us a fortune mm-hmm. we got people in China we got people in in Japan we've got them all over the place why are we doing this? Well, for the very reasons that the person is asking. And, you know, I, my approach with, with leadership is that we ought to tell the congregation everything that we can tell them that is good for them to know. Mm-hmm. And we should safeguard them from things that are unhelpful for them. And I mean by that spiritual issues in people's lives that mm-hmm. are not, we're not, we can't, uh, you know, jeopardize their their integrity, mm-hmm. but this stuff—I I don't think that's a millennial question. I think that's a that's a transgenerational question. Yes, and the next one is very, is very relational. It says we want to be mentored, not preached at. Now again, everything is being put in this kind of yes, uh, yeah. uh, binary category, and I often tell my students, you know, sometimes binaries don't help us. Uh, binaries, uh, binaries. Should perhaps be stated. Maybe this is. I should think of this in the Hebrew, not X, but Y sense, in which right. it's not so much X but Y. Right. And yeah. and think about this. Yeah. If we aren't mentored, if people aren't coming alongside of us to help us in a personal and intimate kind of way, and we're just being preached at, that doesn't help us. Right. Amen. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, I see. I I don't like the. I don't like the. I don't even like the terminology preached at. Okay. Um. Preposition's wrong. Okay. 
and and it and it speaks to actually a very skewed view of what is actually happening in in preaching. Mm-hmm. If we see preaching in terms of Ephesians 4, that we are edifying the saints to enable them to do the works of ministry, if we see it in terms of the feeding of the flock, the leading into pastures, if there is a pastoral tone that pervades the preaching act. An arm around the person as you're speaking. An arm around the shoulder yeah. as you're speaking, yes. which then, which is a short step from there to out of the pulpit. Right. Now, now following through. So, yeah, I think the antithesis is unhelpful there. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. We want to feel valued. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so but, the, so. but, but in fairness, if you're feeling marginalized, if you're feeling like you don't, uh, you, you, your word isn't valued or isn't a part of the discussion, you might feel devalued. You might feel marginalized and, and therefore wondering uh, why you're here. I, uh, I told Alistair before we did the, the podcast that part of what is motivating this particular podcast is a discussion we had with under 30 women uh, who f- – who feel very marginalized in the church, but they're also deeply committed to Christ and deeply committed to the church. They're, they're, it was a complaint made out of love. Right. And, and that's, that's what I think this piece is to a certain extent. So they're saying, you know, they're kind of saying to us, what can turn us off? That's worth listening to. Right. It's essential. Yeah. Yeah. Um, number nine, we want you to talk about controversial issues because no one is. Hmm. That's an interesting one. It is. Um, uh, I know that uh, one of the things that has certainly emerged from our doing these podcasts, these table podcasts, consistently walk into uh, controversial areas, in some cases areas with a time and a depth that you don't necessarily have time in class to deal with in the, in the confines of a normal curriculum. And, and the response, uh, particularly by younger people, has been, I'm so glad we're talking about this on campus. Right. Uh, it's a very common reaction to what it is that, that we've been doing uh, with the podcast. So they, you know, so they, want, they want these conversations to go, to go deep. Now, I think there's another half to this story. And it, it, I would articulate it like this, that sometimes the sermon isn't the place for that to happen, right. that the church has other means that are actually better suited to go there than a sermon might, because I always tell my students, a sermon's a monologue. Right. You know, I don't get the I, – if I get feedback, I get it later, you right. know. Right, uh, But these kinds of issues that we're talking about here that they want discussed are often not monologues. They are conversations. Right. So they need environments where conversation can take place. Yep. And one of the ways we can do that is by simply uh, opening the floor to questions in a context where it's easy to do. Mm-hmm. I, and I like to do that yes. because it's a Socratic way of teaching. Exactly. And we get an oppor- I get an opportunity to uh, respond to find out actually what are the questions that's, that are on the minds of the group that I have in front of me. And when I do that here at the seminary, you know, it's not so much about me being able to try and come up with an answer as it is a huge investigative project on my part to walk away from here and say, you know, that's fascinating. Those questions were all in this area or they were whatever right. they were. And, and the, it enables one in returning to the pulpit to come with a with, with a greater sense of clarity as to the people to whom you're speaking. Yeah, and frankly, sometimes life is awkward and the questions are awkward because sure. life is awkward and being able to model how to function in awkwardness yep. is not always a bad thing because life isn't as neat and clean as we'd often like it to be. Yeah, and I and I think it's I think it's actually a wonderful way to teach. Mm-hmm. And you're right. You yeah. can't. You can I preach four times on a Sunday. The three morning services are all the same. The mm-hmm. evening service is different. It's different content. But there's no way in the world that I can do uh, can fit all of this into that pattern. Right. So then a church has to be intentional about saying, how do we do this? Right. And fair fair I enough. Think that's a good point. Yep. Number number ten. The public perception. This one probably needs to be filled out a little bit. It's time to focus on changing public perception of the church within the community, the neighbors, the city, the people around our city church buildings should be audibly thankful the congregation is part of their neighborhood. We should be serving, and then I'm going to uh, edit this, we should be serving the 
out of them. Probably right. Guess yeah, what yeah. Guess. So yep. anyway, um, so uh, very directly, you know, how, how the church is perceived by its neighbors um, and, and having the positive testimony. Out, we ask this of elders. Right. right. Um, so um, – well, I mean, it, it it covers every level, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. It covers the it covers the way in which we uh, drive around the community, mm-hmm. the way in which we uh, are, are seem to be a pl- a pleasant group. I mean, we do certain things intentionally in this regard, like the mothers against drunk driving. Uh-huh. Uh, the, the 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 police come in, so we do it in a, in our building. Uh, in order that uh, it's the best building for them to do it in, mm-hmm. and so we do it there. In the the, the, the roof blew off uh, blew off a school, mm-hmm. and uh, we gave them our building for uh, for six months. Or four hundred children populated the building. We did it because we had the space and they needed it. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a mechanism to try and make the community think good about us. But years later, people say, "Oh." Parsite, you're the people that took the school in, aren't you? Yeah. Right? Yeah. They're not saying, oh, you're the, you're the one that preached the gospel. They right, said, no, right. So there are all kinds of small ways in which we make huge gains, and I think the point is well made. Yeah, we uh, at our church, we've uh, sometimes, uh, well, we do, we have, a, we have a tutoring service for some of the public schools that are right yeah. around us as a way of saving, this is a concrete way of serving the community Absolutely. and getting to know people in that community in the kind of life that they live that puts us in a better position to minister to them. Number 11. Uh, this is obviously not the Ten Commandments. Uh, number eleven: Stop talking about us unless you're actually going to do something. I actually think this is a re recalibration of yeah. something we've been hearing right. throughout this. You know, show that we show that we matter. Words without follow up are far worse than ignoring us completely. Despite the t- stereotypes about us, we are listening to phrases being spoken in our general direction. Uh, that kind of thing. So it says: Stop speaking in abstract sound bites and make a tangible plan for how to reach millennials. Uh, if you want to res- the respect of our generation, under promise and over deliver. Okay, it's good. I mean, I, I, as I listen to that, you know, there's a young fellow that I'm uh, that I should have met with in the last two weeks, but I've been unable to do so, and he fits this category entirely. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a we had a meeting, and uh, he offloaded his entire operation. I gave him a book by uh, Chesterton, and uh-huh. he went away, and uh, and. And actually, I, I thought that I'd done a horrible job of meeting with a fellow, but actually I must have listened enough uh-huh. to establish a good enough link that uh, the dialogue continues. And so, uh, point well made. Mm-hmm. Point well made. And uh, this, this is where the, um, we're all better together than any one of us is on our own. Right, you know, we're exactly. Not, we're not all good at all these elements. That's right. Okay, here's the last one. Uh, you're failing to adapt. Here's the bottom line, church. You aren't reaching millennials. Enough with the excuses and the blame. We need to accept reality and intentionally move towards this generation that is terrifyingly anti-church. Remember, this is coming from someone who says they love the church but is trying to be self-critical. And I like to remind people whenever you get into this mode and have this kind of a conversation, the prophets are a wonderful example of this. They were pro-Israel. Right. Couldn't have been more pro-Israel. But that, but being pro-Israel didn't mean being so tribal you couldn't be self-critical. Right. And they were very very self-critical at the same time because they were pro-Israel. Right. So how we view and take criticism and how we respond to it um, is actually an important element in in, in growing and in pursuing uh, in pursuing uh, in some cases change, which can be hard for some communities, or in some cases thinking about what we can do that might meet the needs of this group whose needs might be slightly different than the group we're used to ministering yeah. to. Yeah. I, I'd like to know how Paul would have responded to that question uh-huh. in, in Ephesus or uh-huh. whatever it was. Uh-huh. Um, because it is a it, it, that's a sort of perennial thing. A little church history helps in uh-huh. this, doesn't it? Yes, it you does. Know, I mean, in Scotland, uh, in the UK in general, you know, one generation drifts away from God, the next generation. Uh, rejects him completely, and the generation born under them has got no notion whatsoever. Right. But what I've discovered with that group is, mm-hmm. if we appear to be coming up with cute ways yes. to engage them, that turns them off even more. Because there's still got to be substance behind Absolute, whatever you do. Absolutely. Yeah. And so now we're back at good news and good deeds. Right. Right. Yep. 
Absolutely. The church is the you know, I, I like to tell people the church is called the body of Christ for a reason. This is gonna right. sound and that is it is it represents the presence of God in the world in the midst of Jesus' seeming absence. Uh, seeming right. is the key word yeah. here. Yeah. Because he's actually active all the way through it. But the point is the church is supposed to be a reflection and an imitator of who God is. Right. And the better job we do that, some people will not want anything to do with it. Right. We know Scripture tells us that. Jesus told the disciples, you're going to get pushed back. He kind of spent the second half of his ministry preparing him for it. <laughs> yeah. But you want it to push back be for the right reasons, right. not the wrong reasons. Exactly. You want it to be because you're representing the gospel as opposed to yeah. doing something else. Yeah. Well, um, any final word you want to give to us as we kind of wrap this up and think through what it is that we just walked through? Yeah, you know, I... I in 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 search of excellence, that old book. Yeah. At the end, when the when the fellow reviews it, he says there there's uh, there's one thing that all these different companies had in common, and that is they all did the basics well most of the time. Mm-hmm. And so, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength in the way in which this person mentions it, and and uh, living it out is basic. And so if we can just stick with the basics. Well, we thank you for uh, coming by and helping us kind of negotiate this space. Our, our intention is down the road to actually invite in some millennials and hear from them directly uh, rather than kind of – Send me that podcast. That. Uh, we'll send you that <laughs> podcast. I'm, I'm actually interested in it. We, we're in conversations very regularly with, as I said, with this age group at the seminary and at the center. And, and we, uh, we really do a value and respect – many of the concerns that they have as well as having concerns of our own because if you're going to give you got to take and yeah. back ver- and vice versa and this is a healthy conversation for the church to be in I think so yeah so we thank you for being a part of the table uh, today and we hope you'll be back again with us soon thanks for listening to the table podcast for more podcasts like this one visit dts.edu slash the table Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.